This is a WGBH News special presentation celebrating 20 years of Beat the Press. I'm Emily Rooney. Welcome to a special live edition of Beat the Press as we celebrate 20 years on the air. We're joined here by a studio audience and, of course, a panel of media critics and commentators. Adam Riley of WGBH News, John Keller of WBZ, Dan Kennedy of Northeastern University, and Callie Crossley of WGBH. We're going to be talking about how the local media landscape has changed, what got journalists in hot water, what became media obsessions, and of course, our triumphs. So let's get going. First up, the last 20 years have seen tectonic shifts in the local media landscape, none more so than the newspaper industry. But they weren't the only ones affected by a collapsing business model. It's been almost two decades since the Internet rendered the business model for newspapers and magazines obsolete, putting many of them out of business. An entire generation of newspaper readers is going bye-bye and they're not coming back. So much so that in 2009, the New York Times, then owners of the Boston Globe, threatened to shut the paper down. When the Globe is losing $85 million a year, something has to give. Employees did. Then in 2013, Red Sox principal owner John Henry took a gamble, buying the Globe for $70 million, a billion dollars less than the New York Times paid in 1993. But hundreds of layoffs and buyouts later, and a move to a new building... I'm going to miss this place. The Globe is still standing. Not so much the Boston Herald. When you're running out of money and you want to keep people employed, you do what you have to do. Herald publisher Pat Purcell sold his beloved paper to Digital First this year, leaving the Herald a shell of its former self. Also on the cutting room floor, a myriad of local TV news and talk programs, from Channel 5's 5 on 5 we are out of time. Time. To, on. to WLVI's News at 10. Tonight marks a sad and even tragic chapter in Boston television history. More recently, NBC Universal jilted its longtime partner WHDH, forcing Channel 7 owner Ed Anson to reprogram the station. They're going to see, in large part, the same station they've always seen. Minus NBC programming, which is now carried on NBC Boston, if you can find it. On radio, a slew of commercial talk shows bit the dust, although a few found new homes on public radio. Hey, it's Jim Brady. I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio. Then again, some things have just stayed the same. Ah, we're going to be here for a long time coming. <laughs> And so it is. I did predict that, and it yeah. turned out to be true. A long time coming. So I was thinking just how dramatically things have changed in terms of what we used to criticize. And one of the things that changed was the business model. We used to worry about the creep of advertising into editorial content, and that was like the big nail-biter back then. But now that almost seems petty by now. We've lost that battle. And you think about the fact that we, there were classified ads in newspapers when we first got going. There were deadlines. There are no more deadlines. The news business is just a rolling, you know, ball of every, you're on deadline all the time. The minute your story is done, you got to have it published. So the, the whole editorial process has changed dramatically. You know, what really struck me watching this segment is that um, <clears throat> when you go back to 1998, we were already in the Internet era, and we talked a lot about newspaper websites even back then. And yet, uh, there has been so much change in just the last few years. When we started, there was no Google. There was no Facebook, no Twitter, no smartphones. So really, it's been the last 10 or 12 years that this has really accelerated into hyperdrive. And uh, in terms of where the, the, the business model and where the money's going to come from, we've really kind of come full circle. The collapse of advertising that you talk about uh, has led to the death of the idea that newspapers would be able to give away their content online. So today, the big challenge is figuring out a way once again to try to get readers to pay for the news, as they always did until about 20 years ago. 
And one of the things that's really crazy right now is that there are about 50,000 paywalls. So you get, you know, reading the first two lines, and it's like, oh, paywall. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to pay for it, you can do that. Nobody's going to pay for 15 different subscriptions. Maybe you have three that are important to you that uh, this is credible information and you know you can go there and get all the information or you feel that you can get the information you need. But I'm not, even I am not paying for 15 subscriptions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, so, so with the audience, what's happening there? Two or three people behind each paywall? Yeah. Oh, it's mm -hmm. really depressing watching that piece. I personally worked for two of those places, mm -hmm. the Phoenix and Channel 56. So. Maybe I'm the problem. I yeah. really don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll have to tell my colleagues at WBZ not to buy green bananas. Or don't but um, look, there's been a lot of destruction, and that's regrettable. There's also been expansion. Mm -hmm. There's more broadcast news now than there ever was. WGBH and WBUR-FM are one of the few pe uh, cities in the country that have two robust news operations going. Uh, more TV news is available. Uh, we have an all news station essentially over at Channel 7 and NECN as well. So uh, that's potentially a positive sign. The bottom line is what I hope isn't destroyed by this era is the notion of what is quality news. When you see copy editors being fired at the Globe, even the New York Times, that's a little concerning. Are we going to be just a, a hear about it, type it up, and throw it on the web kind of industry or something a little more substantive? I remember working at the Phoenix, not with you. You, you were preceded media me, uh, Dan. <laughs> Maybe uh, you're the right. one that killed it. <laughs> right. yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll take responsibility. Dan, you had moved on as well. But I remember getting a tip that the Times was going to threaten the globe, or the Times company was going to threaten the globe with closure. Was so I was visiting my, my parents in Minnesota. I had a very good source who told me, this is all set to run on tomorrow's front page. And I just didn't believe it initially. It was too too implausible that they would just say, we're going to shut you down. But it wasn't implausible at all. And I think for me, the lesson of that was if the paper of record in Boston can be threatened with you know, elimination, absolutely no one is safe. Uh, one interesting, I think, thing to kick around when it comes to the Globe, there was debate among people at the paper about whether the Times company was a better steward than a local owner would have been. Some people thought the Times was sort of vicious and detached because they were from out of town. Other people thought the Times company mm. protected them from a lot of what they'd be going through otherwise. And, and you know, Dan, you wrote the book on this, but I think it's sort of an open question. I think it's an open question, too. The one thing that we do know for sure is that whether the ownership is the New York Times Company or John Henry, the Globe is far better off than if it had been sold off to one of these uh, hedge fund controlled chains. Yep. Uh, just a, a little number, the, the Globe is still at about 220 people. The Denver Post under Digital First Media is at 60. Wow. That's depressing. Mm. All right, well, Beat the Press was just getting its sea legs when one of the biggest stories of the past 20 years broke. The Boston Globe star columnist Mike Barnacle was accused of plagiarism. But he is just one of many who have faced the firing line. Some survived, some did not. It was the summer of 1998. Globe columnist Mike Barnacle was at the top of his game when he was accused of stealing jokes from comedian George Carlin. So you can accuse me of sloppiness and I plead guilty. Intellectual laziness, I plead guilty. Plagiarism, no. Following that, an internal review determined he had fabricated some stories, forcing him out. That was the same summer Globe columnist Patricia Smith was also forced out after admitting she made up quotes and people. Patricia Smith has virtually disappeared, mm -hmm. uh, while Mike Barnacle is out there and rehabbing himself. At the risk of being accused <laughs> of playing the race card, I would say it's <laughs> obvious why that would be possible for, for him and not necessarily for her. More common, questions of taste. In 2003, after a gorilla escaped from the Franklin Park Zoo, WEEI's Dennis and Callahan likened him to urban kids in a school busing program. They caught him at a bus stop, right? He was like waiting, trying to get a, catch a bus yeah. out of town. Yeah, he's a Metco gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> Had not the Lexington. Exactly. That earned the pair a two-week suspension. They grudgingly apologized on return, something WTKK's Jay Severin rarely did. After several suspensions for demeaning Muslims and Mexicans, this was the final straw. I slept with virtually every young uh, college girl I hired to be an intern or an employee for my firm. And I did it because I could. 
But saying offensive things did not compare to saying things that weren't true. Two of our four helicopters were hit by ground fire, including the one I was in. No kidding. Uh, Exaggeration cost NBC's Brian Williams his nightly news anchor chair and cost Globe columnist Kevin Cullen a three-month suspension. For others, though, it was a matter of plain old bad behavior. This brutal ordeal is now officially over. That was 2004. But it turns out Bill O'Reilly paid about $45 million to 13 women who accused him of sexual misconduct, making him just one of a who's who of prominent journalists taken down, largely as a result of the Me Too movement. Charlie does not get a pass here. The Me Too movement ensnared several local journalists as well. Globe editor Brian McGrory survived accusations, while others did not. It was clearly a message from people who felt hurt, and I felt terrible about that. Still... Other cases are yet to be resolved. Do you know what I find amazing? That the issues are the same 20 years later. Plagiarism, fabrication. Here we are in the internet age when checking this kind of stuff is just so easy with a simple keystroke, and yet people are still trying it, making st- stories up. The big difference is in provocative radio, too, by the way. That hasn't changed in, in 20 years. But the big one that's changed is the Me Too movement because stuff that went on, not just in our industry, but it was big in the media industry, you could get away with, walk away with. You can't do that anymore. So that is the one big thing that's really changed, I think, in terms of behaviors that, that are acceptable or not. Hearing that Jay Severin tape, uh, is, I feel yeah. like I've got to take a shower. It's just so disgusting, <laughs> you know, seeing the picture of him leering as he says those words. When you talk about uh, plagiarism abiding, even though you can check everything in the Internet age, I, th- I actually think that an argument can be made that the way we consume information now makes it more likely that someone's going to slip up and potentially accidentally appropriate someone else's work as their own because we're all looking at, you know, I don't know about you guys, I've got about 12 different windows open during the day when I'm looking for facts about a particular story. I'll go back and I'll try to make sure that, all right, if I'm writing a story about what happened in Lawrence, that I don't repeat the, the language that someone else used. But it is easy to screw up sometimes. Now, in a lot of the cases we talked about, that's not what occurred. Yeah, I think it should be clear that there are a lot of people are not trying to be right. They're just, you know, whatever the information is. And and more to the point, they're not trying to give attribution. Because if you would begin there, then you could corroborate whether or not this is factually true. This is where I got it from. But these days, stuff just lands, and you're like, where did this come from? And if you're (laughs) not paying attention to where the source came from, this is the conversation I have with people all the time, then you're screwed up from the beginning. So uh, you, you can't win that way. And the lines are all blurry, so you have to be... Be very, very careful about where the information comes from. And there's all sorts of other pressures at play on journalists in all, all across the industry that are tra- potential traps. The pressure to produce hot takes mm. uh, often gets people in trouble, particularly in the shoot-from-the-hip environment we live in where any thought, however puerile and disgusting, <laughs> can immediately go out over Twitter. You know, it's... It's a reflex for a lot of people. It's encouraged in this environment. And uh, that stuff lives on forever. Look at Kevin Hart, who just got bounced out of hosting the Oscars because of a 10-year-old tweet, something like that. So uh, uh, there's that pressure. And there's also the allure of being a celebrity journalist, too. A lot of people, why does Brian Williams, who's making millions, he's a star anchor, feel he has to go on talk shows and make up stories about wartime bravery? There's something weird in the water. Well, Brian Williams' real-life ambition was to host a comedy show, so uh, I think that that was part of that. Uh, Seriously, I I can't make heads or tails of it, but that's uh, what he said. Uh, You know, Paul McCartney once said he wrote yesterday and then didn't record it for months because he was convinced that he must have stolen it from somebody. He (laughs) said, it came to me so easily Hmm. that I I felt I must have heard it somewhere. And then finally he realized, no, this actually is my creation, and they went ahead and recorded it. And to John's point, imagine these bits and pieces of of internet flotsam that you pick up in the Mm -hmm. course of a day and you're just expected to keep cranking it out and cranking it out. Uh, If anything, it's a wonder that we don't see more problems with uh, plagiarism and fabrication. By the way, Patricia Smith
Smith is no longer a nobody. No. Or if no, she, she is. Isn't. She is a four times uh, slam poetry, yeah, poetry. winner. She teaches. Um, she writes. Uh, she's not in cool. journalism. No, no that that's was correct. Uh, yeah. That so, was a twenty-year-old soundbite. Yeah, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> All right. She was a finalist for Pulitzer in poetry yeah. this year. All right. Well, an obsessive focus on salacious stories over critical issues was nothing new twenty years ago, but with the extension of twenty-four-hour cable websites like TMZ, Twitter, and beyond. The maw opened wider, and the media filled it. The year Beat the Press debuted, there was the Good Friday peace accord in Northern Ireland, the bombing of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. But nothing caught the media attention like this. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. To be sure, the story was big, but the saga went on with no details spared. Why did you tell Linda Tripp about this dress? Because it was funny. One-time Globe media critic Mark Jerkowitz summed up the coverage that year. Over a year ago, I talked to a bunch of Washington journalists who were sitting around like the Maytag repairman. And all of a sudden, the scandal hits and every Washington journalist is important again. It's a debate that comes up every year. Why do we focus on sensational stories instead of important ones? Here's Callie in 2007 musing over the media's obsession with the untimely death of one-time Playboy centerfold Anna Nicole Smith. I like trash, but even I cannot take this. This is too much. We have got to back away and get some boundaries. Good luck with that. Police are still looking for clues. To the In 2001, the only boundary that ended the media's obsession with missing Washington, D.C. intern Chandra Levy was September 11th. Good Lord. There are no words. For much of the last part of 2001, the media put its obsessions aside. But it didn't take long. The nationwide search is on for the 14-year-old Utah girl kidnapped from her home. The next year, it was the kidnapping of Utah teen Elizabeth Smart. It's real. And on it went. Natalie Holloway, Amanda Knox, Tiger Woods, Casey Anthony, Scott Peterson, Michael Jackson, and of course... The Flate Gate. The Flate Gate. The Flate Gate. My one-time colleague, John Carroll, put it best. The truth of the matter is the, these frenzies add up to nothing, but they, they devalue yeah. the, the news business in the end. Ain't that the truth? You know, some people swept other big stories into obsessions, and I resisted putting them in because I thought they were legitimate. And I mean, I'm talking about things like the missing Malaysia Airlines Jetliner 370, the, um, the Chilean miners story, um, even the Thai cave rescue. These are issues of life and death. And yeah, sometimes there was a lot of speculation over what happened and exaggeration and that kind of thing, but they were legitimate stories. And this whole thing about the mysteries and the beautiful missing white women, for the most part, that's been going on for decades and decades. When you think about it, the, the resurgence now of podcasts that focus on old murders and you know unsolved crimes, it almost like it's a validation of our curiosity about these kinds of things, and I don't see it changing. Well, they're an elemental part of the human condition, right? Sex and violence and sex added together with violence will always fascinate people. I got to push back a little bit at closing on that Lewinsky shot and starting off with the Clinton and Lewinsky sound bites. You can raise complaints about the way that was handled journalistically, and I think you can raise complaints about the way it was handled politically, but we were just lauding the media for its Me Too coverage in the previous discussion. Mm -hmm. The Clinton story is a Me Too story. That's about a grotesque abuse of power by the President of the United States. So. I think at its root, that was completely legit. I, for me, that's no, it was a, a legit, a but it was, a, it was the focus on the salacious. This, I understand yeah. the salacious uh, concern. Yeah. You're not going to cut me off at the bar later <laughs> if I agree with him and not with you on this, will you? No, please say you won't. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, all right. You're not getting promised. All right. Look, uh, uh, you know, Anna Nicole Smith, I couldn't get enough of. All right? I'd watch it again if they'd run it again. Oh, really? <laughs> Absolutely. Because, first of all, drug abuse yeah. is a pretty big story. Now, I'm not saying that was the only thing that drew me to it, but you could make a case that that was a significant moral uh, lesson for a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, this goes, think of the Lindbergh baby. I mean, this goes back mm -hmm. way before cable news. And uh, as Adam points out, it's just uh, the human experience 
uh, that compels people. And, you know, cable news and the current news environment fits the bill. <laughs> We're always laughing in my house about uh, how uh, there's a big hurricane coming. Oh, honey, do you want to turn on the Weather Channel and watch disaster porn? <laughs> and I know that sounds kind of flip, but uh, there's Trump porn. There's all sorts of porn. And everyone loves porn. Right, audience? <laughs> I've said that before. <laughs> uh, this crowd mix, I'm not sure. <laughs> You know, it, it, one of the things that struck me watching this is that there are times when a story grabs everybody's attention in such a way that we all kind of gather around the water cooler. And today, I think that even with those kinds of stories, they immediately get chewed up and spit out in this hyper-polarized uh, environment that we have that we move on immediately to you know what does this mean politically and whose side are you on uh, watching the the horror of 9-11 uh, God knows I wouldn't want to see that happen again but I don't know that we would have the unity around that that we did uh, even that short time ago mm. the, the the blaming and the mm. partisanship would begin immediately and uh, and I think that's really a shame with the Thai boys in the cave we didn't see that it was a no. kind of coming together in that way I I will say that when we put obsession on a story, we really get obsessed. I was at 2020 when uh, the Lewinsky uh, interview with Barbara Walters took place. You want to know the biggest question from people? What was the color of her lipstick? I am serious. That's how detailed and granular it got about that. That was a huge yeah. sidebar to that interview, which was about all the issues you said, but really it yeah. was about the, the lipstick color. What was it? Uh, it was uh, magenta. It was fuchsia. Uh, yeah, no, no. It was like from the pla Monaco or something. I can't remember. Monaco. You know, yeah, it was something like that. It was. Thanks, I don't know, know what I, that is. I don't they had a cute name, but uh, I mean, that's but that's the level of that yeah. we get to today. It, it, and my thing is, I am nosy, but there got to be some boundaries around this stuff. And you I mean, like trash. And I, I like trash. I, but come on, put some boundaries around it, yeah. and and. Get down I'm going to use that. What? I'm going to use that quote in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I just think you just have to get to you know looking at what the real story is and not some of this other stuff. All right. Well, yeah. hope we haven't painted too negative a picture of the media over the past 20 years because much of it, if not most of what the press at large has done, has been good. Some of it even excellent. And there were several moments in local coverage that particularly stand out. The Boston Phoenix and others got the ball rolling, exposing clergy sexual abuse and a cover-up by the Boston Archdiocese. But it was the Boston Globe that broke it wide open in 2002. We were able to get internal uh, documents of the church. We were able to sort of get a window on how the church internally was operating. The Globe's Pulitzer Prize winning reporting was relentless, smoking out dozens of pedophile priests, leading to the arrest and convictions of two particularly prolific predators. John Gagan and Paul Shanley. If we didn't see that story, we wouldn't be sitting here. The family of Greg Ford came forward, as did many others. I can tell you where Christ is. He's alive and well on Morrissey Boulevard. In the end, Archbishop Bernard Law was forced to resign and dozens of priests were excommunicated. I want to point out to people that this is what good journalism looks like. So many times we discuss on the show what bad journalism looks like. The worst terrorist attack ever on American soil also brought out the best in American journalism. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. News organizations sent teams of reporters across the country and abroad, seeking the truth behind the hijackers and their motives, leading to one of the longest-running wars in modern history. The media also got high marks for its coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings. We were looking in that direction right when that bomb went off. So suspect number one was interviewed by the FBI back in 2011. The media played a significant role, too, in the relentless and dogged pursuit of James Whitey Bulger. He was running rackets, murdering his enemies, cooperating with the FBI, and under investigation by the state police. And they just had this wonderful photo album of Whitey, Stevie doing business here, mafia figures, the Angelo brothers coming over for meetings, you know, very rich uh, investigative material. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. Finally, we have to give credit to the home team for bringing out the best in owners, fans, and journalists. On October 27, 2004, after 86 years of frustration, 
but the big one that's eluded even the best investigative teams. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist, a mystery now older than this show. <laughs> when I was going back looking over 20 years worth of material, I have to just say that nothing stood out like that globe spotlight piece on the Catholic Church. And we have given credit to the um, Boston Phoenix and to WBZA that did some fine reporting on it, but they really um, broke that open, as editor Marty Barron said, and uh, it's still an ongoing story 20 years later. That's the shocking part of it, um, that the church seems to still be doing some of the same things that it was doing all those years ago, even after being exposed, after paying out millions and millions of dollars um, it's it's incredible. I, I just want to say, though, that just in terms of some other triumphs in the in the press, I, I think the advent of some of the technology that we're using today, it's just spectacular, the immediacy that it can have its dangers. And just I also want to say I think that the press has learned its lesson and become a little bit more cautious in how quickly they report things. It used to be the, the second something happened, like the Oklahoma City bombing, it'd say, oh, it had to, be, had to be Muslims. And I think we've taken a step back. The segment you created for this show, Emily, Rants and Raves, I think says it all. When I'm out at, at Dunkin' Donuts getting my coffee and people come up and they want to talk to me, mainly it's ranting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, every once in a while, there's a rave that hits home, which is uh, you, you, one of your reporters helped me. Mm. I appreciated the fact that this story helped expose this. At its best, the media and journalism holds powerful forces accountable, helps people who would otherwise not be helped or heard, and that's when we deserve the rave. I just want to say something about the Boston bombing story as a local story. All national media descended here. It was an international story. But the local reporting was fantastic. It was. And I, I, I mean, I just, I am still. I'm glad you said about, that because it actually. Yes. Local news gets a bad rap for yes. being, you know, leading with crime and all that stuff. But they, they really measured up. And it's just, they can be, do it just like anybody else. It was fabulous. That, yeah, I yeah. just wanted to make sure that was clear. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked about the business models earlier. Probably the most difficult thing to do in this environment is to pay for accountability journalism because yes. it's incredibly expensive. I thought it was interesting that recently the Globe did a major follow-up on the Catholic Church. And they did it in conjunction with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mm -hmm. And they got funding from the Lenfest Institute, which is the nonprofit that owns the Philadelphia Inquirer. So it's really good to see that news organizations are finding ways to do the stuff that really matters uh, in this difficult right. time. Last word One quick point about the, the Globe's work on church sex abuse. I think if Marty Barron hadn't been the editor, an outsider who came to town and thought, well, of course we go to court to get the documents, we'll never know if it would have happened otherwise. But I think it suggests the advantage of having someone come in who doesn't know the city and has a fresh pair of eyes. Damn glad he's down at the post right now. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right, that is it. Thanks to all of you who've joined us here tonight, as well as those watching at home. And thanks for being loyal viewers over the years, too. Thanks, too, to the many people who have worked on this program over the years. And that is it for our 20th Beat the Press anniversary special. Our show will continue on Facebook Live for a little longer with a question and answer session. You can find that online right now at facebook.com slash WGBH News. I'm Emily Rooney.